Hello, class. Uh, I'm back. This is uh, History 102, lecture number 27, and we'll be covering World War II with this particular lecture. So, uh, as I left off last time, World War II uh, begins on September 1st, 1939, with the German invasion of Poland. Now, uh, the rest of the year is of 1939, as far as conflict goes, is not the event that eventful, but that's because Germany is preparing for its big time invasion, and that'll happen in early 1940 when Germany invades France. Now, a little bit of background information on the French and their preparations previously. After World War I, they had vowed that France would never be the battlefields once again like it was during the trench warfare of World War I. And uh, their big-time military strategist, General Maginot, will come up with what he believes to be a brilliant plan, and the French will obviously agree, and they're going to build this big defensive structure uh, between France and Germany on the border that they share. And it's this big, giant, defensive bunker-style wall known as the Maginot Line. And it'll be fortified with huge, you know, 40-inch guns. It'll be something that a tank could never blast its way through, which obviously has become the Germans' preferred method, who's illustrated in the invasion of Poland. And they were all smug and, you know, basically said, Hitler can never break through the Maginot Line, so we have nothing to worry about. Well, north of France, sharing a border with Germany, is the country of Belgium. There was no Maginot Line on the border between Belgium and Germany or between Belgium and France. They were friendly. <clears throat> so when Germany invades France, he invades it through Belgium. <clears throat> and is before the French know it, German panzer tanks are on the French side of the Maginot Line which comically becomes known as the imaginary line. And the French were so short-sighted that the big, giant 40-inch guns they had on turrets on top of the Maginot Line only swang in 180 degrees towards Germany. <clears throat> they could not swing around 360 degrees to shoot at the tanks on the French side of the line because supposedly those tanks would never make it there. <clears throat> so Hitler will invade France, and France will fall faster than anyone ever anticipated. And before people really realize it, <clears throat> Nazis are marching through the streets of Paris. So with this unfortunate occurrence, FDR starts seeing the writing on the wall. Now, uh, let me go back a little bit and discuss something that we've covered in passing last time. That series of neutrality acts that were passed. They're passing one just about every year up to 1939. <clears throat> the original ones were very restrictive. We weren't supposed to sell weapons to anybody, uh, meaning any aggressor could not buy weapons. By the time we get to 1939, FDR had convinced Congress to back off. <clears throat> now we could sell weapons to European democracies, but it was still on a cash and carry basis. So one thing that you need to realize is, excuse me, FDR saw this evil menace coming, namely Adolf Hitler. If FDR would have had his way, he would have declared war on Germany in 1939 along with the French and the British. But Congress wanted no part of that. So FDR is going to have to sort of tap dance around 
assisting the Allies as best he can until ultimately he can convince Congress to declare war on the Axis powers, which now also include Japan. So it, after France falls so quickly, that sort of wakes up Congress. <clears throat> They're going to pass uh, a military spending bill to tremendously build up the United States military because FDR convinces them you may not want to declare war, but someday you may have no choice and you better be prepared this time, not like the past. So Congress passes a $37 billion military buildup bill in 1940 after France falls. Then, shortly after that, <clears throat> they will pass the first ever peacetime draft of American men into the military. We're manufacturing all these military supplies and equipment. Now we need to train the men to utilize them. So at least this time, when we do have to enter World War II, it won't be like World War I in the Spanish-American War where we declare war and prepare later. That's thanks to FDR and his foresight. Now, <clears throat> It also, towards the end of 1940, as it becomes quite obvious, the only holdout left in Europe, because uh, after the fall of France, Hitler's just running roughshod throughout Europe, wherever he wants to go. The only holdout is England. And that's because they're on an island and they'd have to cross the British Channel from France to invade England. But in the meantime, <clears throat> the German Luftwaffe, which is their air force, is relentlessly bombing England, including London, inflicting horrible damage on the country, which as far as Hitler is concerned, he's softening it up for an invasion. <clears throat> so... FDR and the brand new Prime Minister of England, Neville Chamberlain, the great appeaser, obviously has been voted out of office for his mistakes. <clears throat> the new leader is Winston Churchill, who FDR is going to get along with famously. And initially, he'll be sending his top advisor, I mentioned quite some time ago, Harry Hopkins, to meet with, that, with uh, Churchill secretly. <clears throat> now, so in late 1940, they're going to pass the Lend-Lease Agreement with England. According to this agreement, we will lend England 50 out-of-date U.S. Navy destroyers. They're being ready to be mothballed because of the $37 billion buildup. We're building a brand new Navy. So we're going to lend them to England so it's not an outright, you know, act of us aiding them. And in exchange, they're going to lease us eight British military bases scattered around the globe in the British Empire, which they really have no use for at that point because they're lining up all their defenses to defend against what they believe will be an impending invasion of the Germans coming across the English Channel. <clears throat> so they need, basically, anything that can float to defend the shorelines of England. And 50 old U.S. destroyers, World War I vintage, will do the job. So this has to pass Congress, and there are plenty of people, Democrats and Republicans, who are against it. <clears throat> and uh, one of them is the Republican, uh, Senator Taft, who is the son of former President Taft. And in a famous debate over this, he argues, <clears throat> how in the world do you lend someone a destroyer? What's going to happen to these? The Germans will sink them. They'll be at the bottom of the English Channel. <clears throat> He's... 
uh, uses the analogy, it's like lending somebody a piece of chewing gum. Do you want it back when they're done with it? I don't think so. He's pretty right about that. But remember, FDR has got a two-thirds majority in both houses. The Lend-Lease Agreement passes. So uh, the next thing that happens in the very next year of the war, 1941, <clears throat> England is successfully holding out so Hitler decides to take a big gamble and turn his attention uh, to the East. He's going to break his agreement with Stalin, the non-aggression pact. And in, on June 22nd, 1941, Germany will invade Russia. That is Hitler's first big mistake. So far in World War I, Everything he's done, everything he's planned has gone without a flaw. And some things happen faster than he anticipated, like the fall of France. So, <clears throat> this is a big mistake for a couple reasons. He underestimates the tenacity and capabilities of the Soviet Union. And he waits too late to invade. He invades almost at the end of June. And he believes he'll be able to conquer Russia or the Soviet Union before winter sets in, in 1941. In fact, he's so confident and cocky by this point, German troops do not even have any winter supplies with them whatsoever. They figure they'll conquer the country and take what they need there. Well, just like with Napoleon... The Russian winner will be the downfall of Adolf Hitler, just like it was with Napoleon Bonaparte. And the Russians or the Soviets know time's on their side. So they're going to practice something that we covered at the very beginning of this class, scorched earth policy. They would destroy everything in the Germans' path for about 20 miles ahead of them and fall back systematically. The Germans would then be able to move in very easily, but they could not procure any sort of supplies. This worked very effectively delaying the German advance. And before anybody knew it, the Russian winter comes and it's going to be all downhill for the Germans after that. <clears throat> now, the next thing that we need to cover, even though we jumped ahead a little bit of just a bit here, uh, is uh, the election of 1940. Now, FDR decides to break George Washington's tradition and run for an unprecedented third term. No president had ever attempted that. Now, his line of logic is that it's a time of world crisis. He's working very closely with what's left of the Allies, namely Winston Churchill, and it's no time to change leadership. It In that transitional period, it could be the opening that either Hitler or the Japanese were looking for and it would make America vulnerable to attacks. So he runs again and the Republicans will field a candidate this time thinking that FDR is vulnerable for a couple reasons that I'll sum up in a minute. And that candidate will be Wendell Wilkie. Now, uh, the Republicans believe that FDR is vulnerable for two reasons. One, no president has attempted a third term. And I mean, there's just campaign pins. I'm a campaign button collector that just say on them, no third term. And everybody knew what that meant. I'm not voting for FDR because I don't want a three-term president. Uh, so that, they believe, makes him vulnerable plus the court packing plan, they believe, made him quite vulnerable. Now, when the votes are all tallied up in 19, November of 1940, 
FDR will receive 27 million votes, almost the same exact amount he received before, and Wendell Wilkie will receive 23 million votes. You can see how many more voters there were. So he'll win by a quite comfortable 4 million vote margin. Now, obviously, it's not the 11 million that he won by in 1936, but it's still a comfortable margin. FDR was a brilliant politician. After winning in 1936, he basically knew, I got an 11 million vote margin to burn. I'm going to burn some of it and I'm going to burn it on the court. He did that and got his way. Didn't have to increase the number. Then he also burned some of that political currency on assisting the Allies against the wishes of many people. But he was so brilliant, he still won by a 4 million vote margin. Now, one thing I failed to mention with the election of 1936, and this will also be the case with 1940, they shifted inauguration day to 19 or to January 20th in 1937 and that'll also be the case in 1941. So FDR sworn in in January 20th 1941 for his completely unprecedented third term as president. <clears throat> now, in August of that year after the big mistake that the Germans make in June of 41, there will be a top secret meeting held between Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill on an American ship off the coast of Newfoundland. This is one of the most secret meetings ever to take place and the meeting of these two great world leaders. It's the first time they meet face to face. And obviously secrecy is the name of the game because if a German U-boat knew those two were on that ship, they would have torpedoed it immediately. <clears throat> so this becomes known as the Atlantic Conference of August 1941. And this kind of shows the brilliance of Churchill and FDR. They both know Hitler made a fatal mistake with the invasion of the Soviet Union. And they're going to start planning future cooperation between the United States and England to defeat Adolf Hitler, uh, everything short of declaring war. And they'll start talking about the future of the post-World War II world. They're so confident that Hitler blew it, which obviously they're right. <clears throat> they talk about how they need to form a military alliance uh, for the Atlantic Ocean, which becomes NATO, which still exists today. And they also talk about the trials and tribulations of the League of Nations and how it needs to be replaced with a much more efficient organization, which will become the United Nations. This is all discussed on a ship in August of 1941. So, uh, the next thing we want to talk about that happens in 1941, obviously, is the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Now, uh, there's some background information to really understand what happened on that fateful day, December 7th, 1941. Now, just like Hitler had been running roughshod throughout Europe, the Japanese had been running roughshod through Asia. They had occupied China early on. They had also occupied Indochina, which was the French colony. That's Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. So because of these actions, the United States had frozen all Japanese assets in the United States. So if they had money invested in the stock market or whatever, they couldn't touch it. And they had suspended the sale of gasoline to Japan. Japan's another country that is highly dependent on uh, oil imports and even gasoline imports because they have very few uh, oil reserves themselves and they lacked in 
uh, gasoline refining capacity where the United States had plenty. So negotiations had began in November of 1941 between the Americans and Japanese. And the Japanese obviously wanted to unfreeze their assets and the United States sell them gasoline. Now, here's something that's going on behind the scenes. From day one, United States intelligence had cracked the secret Japanese communication code that they used for their military. And we could decode all intercepted messages and we knew exactly what they were saying. Now, we never ever let on that we had cracked the code. This was also a very big top secret. And in fact, the Japanese through the course of World War II never ever knew we had cracked their code because we were so sly about it. We never let on that we knew what they were gonna do before they did it. It's gonna be very useful to us during the war. Now, on the other hand, the United States had an uncrackable code. You may have seen the film before, The Wind Talkers, who keyed in on the Navajo. But there were also Mohawk Wind Talkers. And basically what they did in both Europe and Asia, they had Native Americans in the United States military who spoke to each other over uh, communication radios in very obscure dialects of the Navajo language and the Iroquois language, which the Germans and the Japanese had no clue how to crack because hardly anybody in the world spoke these languages except for our personnel. These were... These men were very, very brave men. They were our code talkers, radio men. And all of them were highly trained and all of them were equipped with cyanide tablets that they were instructed to immediately take if they were ever captured. Because the Americans knew if one of these code talkers were captured by either Japanese or the Germans, They'd be tortured so severely until they finally gave up the code. So that's why finally, in the not too distant past, these men were recognized for their bravery and they're all highly decorated, but unfortunately to many of them, it was too late. So uh, we had broken the Japanese code. We're negotiating with them and we knew something was fishy. Now, the Pacific Japanese fleet, as far as we determine, had gone on maneuvers in the Northern Pacific, and they were out training, supposedly. As we'll find out later, this was all a diversion. And remember, we don't have satellites where we can follow movements of countries and we don't have the whole globe covered in radar like we do today. So <clears throat> once this fleet left Japan and went into the northern waters of the Pacific, they're untraceable. <clears throat> now we'll know that they'll make a big turn south, and this will be the same fleet that attacks Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> so let me tell you about what happened on that fateful day early morning of December 7th, 1941. We lost track of the Japanese fleet. Now at Pearl Harbor, obviously we've got the naval station there that we've had since the 1800s. Uh, Our Pacific fleet was stationed there. And uh, they had this thing set up where, you know, they had radar in Hawaii and they could track out so far that they were pretty confident that they wouldn't be attacked because they could detect an enemy ship, especially what's going to be used in this case, aircraft carriers, before they reached the point of no return, so to speak. 
When a plane takes off the deck of a carrier, uh, it's got to have enough fuel in it to go, have its bombing mission, and then return and land on the deck. We could track aircraft carriers further out than that round trip capacity. So we were confident we'd know what was going on. Now, the Japanese knew that too. So on that fateful morning, their aircraft took off of the decks of Japanese carriers before they reached the range of our radar, which meant that many of these Japanese pilots knew they were on suicide missions, that they didn't have enough fuel to return back to the deck of the carriers they took off on. Now, obviously, after they take off, the carriers can go full steam ahead and try to make up some lost time. But as uh, was the case, many of these Japanese pilots had to ditch their planes in the middle of the Pacific and were lost at sea on the return flight back to their carriers. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, in the wee hours, early hours of a Sunday morning, all these blips start appearing on the radar screen. They're Japanese aircraft. The guys who were at the radar station radio in <clears throat> to their commander and say, we think we're being invaded by Japanese aircraft. And they're going, are you sure? Do you see any aircraft carriers? And they say, no. So they initially think that these guys are misinterpreting the radar readout. So this buys the Japanese valuable time. The Japanese then fly in, inflict their damage, sinking a large portion of the United States Pacific Fleet anchored in Pearl Harbor, including the famous ship, the Arizona and others, which you can visit if you'd go then. <clears throat> Luckily for the United States, all of our aircraft carriers were out on the high seas because there were hurricane threats in the region. And when you have that sort of thing, large ships like aircraft carriers go out to sea because they'll weather the storm much better than if they're bottled up in a harbor. So we lucked out on that and they weren't destroyed. <clears throat> now to wrap this Pearl Harbor business up, uh, many of you are aware there's controversy surrounding Pearl Harbor. Some people argue that FDR and some key members of the War Department knew the attack on Pearl Harbor was going to take place and allowed it to happen so that we'd finally be dragged into World War II and have to declare war. Now, there's been a lot of books written about this. I went to a conference about 10 years ago at Siena College, and the whole conference was about this theory. And I left that conference convinced FDR did not know. Sure, we had cracked the code, but the Japanese fleet had gone into complete silence on its maneuvers, so we hadn't intercepted any messages that indicated it. And as one historian from Princeton uh, argued very effectively at one of the sessions I went to, <clears throat> was there's no piece of written evidence left behind promoting or, uh, you know, confirming this conspiracy theory. And all the people that could have possibly known about it are now all dead. And as this historian argued, if there was any sort of piece of written evidence in the archive somewhere, somebody would have found it by now because historians have been spending their lives trying to prove this. Because if you cracked this and proved it, you'd be an instantaneous millionaire with the books you'd be able to write and speaking to her. Plus, he argued, <clears throat> someone who knew about it, one of these high-ranking generals or admirals, on their deathbed, probably in all likelihood, would have confessed and said, I can't take it anymore. I have this horrible secret. I knew about Pearl Harbor and I let it happen. I'm so, so sorry. I'm trying to clear their conscience before they died. None of these men ever did that. So 
I'm convinced FDR and the higher-ups of the War Department did not know this attack was happening. But this is what caused us to enter World War II. So I'll call her quits for now. I'm going to come back with one more lecture today. Uh, we're going to talk about U.S. involvement in World War II after Pearl Harbor. So let me take a break, get my voice back, have a drink of water. I'll be back with you shortly.